All right, let's talk about patient assessment. And like I've said, this is an exciting thing for us to discuss because it relates to really a critical interpersonal skill, right? To be aware of how I'm doing and then to become aware of how someone else is doing, right? So um, we'll talk about reasons for learning good assessment skills. Uh, we'll talk about aid it again, but it will be on the quiz, it will be on the test. Um, and it's something that you'll use all the time and it will keep you from making mistakes. Uh, we'll talk about how to get a good history. Now, we could spend an entire lecture, like a two hour lecture, just talking about how to get a good history. I'm going to spend like two or three slides on it. Um, but just know that's a much bigger discussion um, and it's something that will be the conversation will continue. The conversation starts today on how to get a, get a good history. It will continue as you progress through your clinical studies. Um, how we find out what the patient's diagnosis is or admitting diagnosis, um, measurements of temperature, uh, heart rate, respiration rate, how to do that. There's some terminology here, right? Um, and I'll try to identify where those are in the textbook. Uh, what's going on with a carotid pulse versus an apical pulse. Um, normal values, I've said that's what's going to be on the quiz. How to obtain a blood pressure. We'll talk about lab tests. Um, cardiac arrhythmias. So if you're doing e ECGs, you may be asked to do ECGs or EKGs. It's nothing to be scared of and a lot of times the machine will tell you already if, if something's going on, and atrial fibrillation is one of the most common things. Um, here's some key terms, and these are again just, I know the slide, it looks like the slide cut off a little bit, but um, these are the same ones that are there in the, in the chapter. Um, so I just, they're there mostly as a reminder for me to tell you that this is important like we've already discussed. Okay, so these kind of map onto what I was saying for the skills checkoff, right? It's kind of the same concepts. We need to be observative. We need to be watching what's going on in the patient's room. How are they interacting with family members? How are they sitting in their bed or on their wheelchair? Or um, what is their affect? Like, how are they behaving? Do they seem nervous? Um, is there, uh, what are kind of signs of nervousness, right? What are signs that maybe they're in pain? Um, what are signs that uh, they're slipping in and out of consciousness? Like how cognitive, how aware are they? Um, and so we're kind of sizing people up constantly. Um, there's uh, a friend of mine who worked as a bartender, and he said, man, as a bartender, you really kind of become like a, um, a like unlicensed psychologist, right? Because you're dealing with people all the time who are telling you all their baggage, right? And really, you just want their money for the drinks, but you kind of have to listen to them and figure out, like, you know, what does this person need right now? Or just, should I cut them off? Do they not need another drink? Those kinds, of, those types of things. I think we're, we kind of do the same thing. We're kind of unprofessional psychologists. We're trying to figure out, okay, where is this person at? How receptive they are, are they to what I'm saying? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, We'll talk about the assessment piece, and that's largely what we're going to be focusing on this class. Um, but of course, communication's key to that as well. So again, like I've stressed already, asking people's permission. Can I take your blood pressure? Can, may I have your arm, right? Um, can I wrap this around your arm? Can I place this in your ear to take your temperature, right? Those types of things are really, really vital, right? Just think about it. I mean, we start, to, we start to take it for granted, but we work in a profession where within like 30 seconds of meeting a girl, I can ask her if there's any chance she's pregnant. That's a little weird, right? Um, so we need to be aware of that. We can become immune to that, and it's very shocking to our patients. Like, no one's ever treated them like that before, right? Um, no one's ever just grabbed their arm and started placing things on their arm before, right? And if we're not careful, that could be very easily misconstrued, right? Um, so communication, asking, asking for permission, but then also relaying information. So if there's ever a question, and the value that we've found as we're assessing the patient, 
communicating that back to the physician who requested the exam, or perhaps communicating it to the radiologist to, to then discuss with the ordering physician or to discuss with you how best to proceed. Um, Communication is key, and you're part of a team, so communicating, identifying, okay, patient's heart rate is elevated, their blood pressure is really, really high. I am number one, not a cardiologist, not a pulmonologist, not a radiologist, so I'm going to communicate that information to people who are those things, and then I, they will tell me how best to proceed, right? Um, that's really, really critical. Um, I will probably repeat that again and again and again because for whatever reason, it's a blind spot that we, we tend to have when we're first starting out. Um, like, you know the old saying, the buck stops here, have you ever heard that? Well, guess what? The buck don't stop here, right? Um, in this case, you have to be on a team, you have to relay information to the appropriate people. Like if the patient's heart rate is elevated and their blood pressure's up, I don't need to call the social worker, right? I don't need to be like, hey, hey, what's going on with this patient's heart rate and blood pressure? They're like, why are you calling me? No, there's a person I need to call, right? So identifying who that is is a part of the critical thinking skill, part of the chain. So aided, we know it. I'm not gonna uh, really stress this. Um, it is helpful to the patient to tell them what the duration is, because guess what? It preempts a question. The first question on their mind is how long is this gonna take? So it shows that you're aware of what's going on. And then I cannot, the only other thing I'll stress in this one is thank your patients. On leaving, thank your patients. Don't tell them have a nice day, because guess what? If you have end stage cancer, you are not going to have a nice day. Right? And the second someone tells you, you to have a nice day, because they're so sick of people telling them to have a nice day, they're going to bite your head off, right? even though you had good intentions. So thank them. That's the best way we can exit. Right? Thank you. Um, hope to see you again sometime. Actually, even hope to see you again sometime sounds a little morbid and weird. Right? So just thank you. Thank you for letting me serve you today. All right. Let's talk about taking a history. There's some techniques that we can use that are going to make people talk more in general, right? There's also things we can do that will make people talk less. But when we're taking a history, what we really want is to get the person as chatty as possible, right? In most circumstances. Now, there is like chatty Cathy's out there, and I don't know, chatty, chatty Craig's. Um, <laughs> trying to be as gender neutral in this description <laughs> as possible. but. Um, there are people who just talk way too, too, too much. And so you'll figure out, but generally if people talk way too, too, too much, um, they're okay if you interrupt them. You can steer the conversation, right? Um, back to what, you know, Grandpa Simpson went off on his World War II ex expositions. Now I need to get him back onto what's happening today when he fell in the bathroom. All right, so, but asking open-ended questions. What is an open-ended question? It is anything that can't be answered by a yes, no, or maybe, right? So do you like me is not an open-ended question, right? Um, an open-ended question, a version of that is like, what kind of people do you like, right? Um, well, then the person's gonna describe the kind of people that they like, and it will be a more lengthy discussion. Um, we wanna facilitate people when necessary so this is a diversity consideration right you will have patients who are deaf you will have patients who are mute you'll have people who are selectively hearing impaired right what do I mean by that there are some older patients who cannot hear your sweet high school student girl voice right they cannot hear that register of sound so you'll need to lower your tone of voice, right? Because they can still hear bass notes. I know that sounds crazy, but they cannot hear a high-pitched voice. You have to lower the pitch of your voice. It's not a volume thing. You do not need to start shouting at them in your best cheerleader voice. They will not hear, they will see you shouting at them, but they will not hear the yells, right? Um, you need to lower the pitch of your voice. There are, um, or other things that you may need to facilitate, like having a pad of paper and a pen at hand is helpful because there's some people who, if they rely on sign language, like American Sign Language, to, to communicate primarily, they're also accustomed to writing things down for people, right? Um, another example, if you're working with someone who's hearing impaired, is you may need to speak directly at them 
and move your mouth as much as possible while you are talking, right? So going over here and doing this while I'm talking and talking fast, they can't do that. But if I'm talking directly to them, they can read my lips. I think that's amazing. Like, isn't that cool that they figured that out? It's amazing. So work with them on that. Um, it may be a benefit to learn a little sign language, just enough to say thank you and hi, right? That goes a long way, right? Learning thank you in Spanish goes a long way. Um, learning hello and how are you in Spanish goes a long way towards making people, facilitating them and helping them feel welcome. Um, using silence. I do this a lot as a teacher where I ask a question and then I just sit there. What's happening when I do that? It may seem a little awkward or uncomfortable, but what's, what I think is happening is the person's gears are starting to turn. That silence is not an unproductive silence. It's allowing the gears to turn inside their head. And the, I know the longer I wait, the more likely I am to get a good answer, right? So it might be a little awkward, right? But it's like, um, I have a, a child in my family who stutters, right? And so silence, sitting there and allowing the individual to stutter, right, um, is beneficial. It's showing them I'm patient enough to listen. I'm not going to cut you off, right? I want to hear what you have to say. It's important to me. Um, so silence is helpful. Um, reflecting and reiteration. Those are fancy terms for um, I've heard what you said. Here's what I've written down on my chart, right? You told me that you have shortness of breath. Okay, I understand that you have shortness of breath. How long has that been going on? So. Quickly, briefly reiterating to the individual what you've recorded. And that actually helps steer the conversation as well. So if there's an individual who's doing the Grandpa Simpson thing, y'all are familiar with Grandpa Simpson, right? You ask, you ask Grandpa Simpson a question and he just kind of goes off, well, in 1942 we were eating ice cream, but the ice cream went out of style because we were all eating licorice in 1952 and then the atomic bombs went off and man, that girl knew how to dance. Like it's just, <laughs> where do we go? Um, so steering them back to like, well, how long have you been eating ice cream for, right, is helpful. Um, uh, so that's that reiteration thing. I heard that you were eating ice cream in 1942. Have you continued to eat ice cream, you know? Um, and that's why you're having the heart problems that you're having now. <laughs> so uh, reflection and reiteration is a way to kind of steer the conversation. Um, clarification. Hey, I understood that you said that you've been eating ice cream in 1942, right? Um, Getting back to what we're talking about, how long have you been having the heart problems that you're having today, right? So try to make them make the connections is helpful, right? Um, if you don't understand a term that the patient used, ask them what that means. Um, I think I may have already shared this story with you, but it, it bears repeating. Um, my father was once getting history from a patient. They told him that he had had a massive internal fart, right? What does that mean, right? Well, the heart. The doctor said there's something with my heart. Oh, you mean a massive internal infarction, right? Which is very different from. I think you could have a massive internal fart. Like that is possible. Um, I don't want to be there when that happens. You know, um, I don't think anyone does. Uh, so asking clarification is important, um, and then summarizing. So as we're making notes, we don't need to write down the whole thing about the ice cream and the atomic bomb and the girl dancing. We just need to write down, this dude's been eating ice cream for a long time and now he's got heart problems, right? Ice cream is actually really bad for your heart, which stinks. And apparently there's viral videos about people licking ice cream now, which is disgusting. Like, I rate that, and things that disgust me is that, and then just above that is like people throwing cheese on babies' faces. Like, I, I never, <laughs> that bothered me. It's like, how far we've fallen. This is what we're using the internet for. All right. These things, you need to memorize each one of these. So this will be on the quiz. Um, onset. When did this start happening? I'm seeing an un, a uncertain face. Is it about this? Mm -hmm. About cheese on the face, baby's faces? Mm -hmm. I think it's about the movie. That girl. They're talking about that girl licking ice cream. She's about to go to jail for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah she's, what is that disease? Like with your lungs and you can catch like an illness and it can kill you really quick. 
I don't know. Make sure like more oh, from like uh, about like the movie Fast and the Furious. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll come back to cystic fibrosis <laughs> in about two years. So hold on to the girl with eating, licking the ice cream, or whatever. Um, all right, but onset. How long has this been going on for? For with cystic fibrosis, it's been going on since the day I was born. Right. <laughs> this happened in utero. Um, duration. Right. So this this means okay. So because sometimes you'll ask them how long has this been going on for, and they'll give you some kind of vague answer. And so really getting down to like the nitty gritty. Is this a is this something that was acute, or is this something chronic? Is this something developmental? Is it something genetic? Those types of questions are important. Um, so it's a little bit different from onset. Also developing a chronology. This happened, this happened, this happened. Grandpa Simpson was eating ice cream, then the atomic bomb went off, a girl was dancing. Okay, what of those is important? He's been eating ice cream since 1942, right? Um, so knowing the chronology of events is important and selecting what of the chronology relates to the condition that he has today is that critical thinking skill, right? Um, Getting a specific location, where are you hurting, where is this occurring, those types of things. Really helpful to physicians, really helpful to the radiologist. The patient has left-sided chest pain. That needs to be in the information that you're communicating to the radiologist, right? Um, the severity of the pain, a lot of times we use a pain scale. So on a, severe, on a scale of one or zero to 10, zero being absolutely no pain, um, to 10 being like the worst, most excruciating pain in your life, where are you at? Asking the patient to quantify it. We call that a symptom, right? Because it is a, it's subjective. It's a symptom because it's subjective. The patient's telling me, subjective to my body, I'm at an eight right now. That's me. Um, there's other folks, like I always think about like, um, some of the uh, folks that I've treated who are from the old country, from Europe, you know, Holland, the Germany, Poland, those women, you could drop a brick on their head and they'll have a pain registry of one, right? They just do not complain, right? Um, so culturally, understanding culturally what's going on here. Like I had a, a neighbor of mine in Austin, Texas, um, who really struggled with registering pain and I had, to, I had to tell him eventually he had cancer I was helping him get to his cancer appointments and he had a, a, a abscess in his tooth he never told me about the tooth abscess I was like Jerry you have to tell me he just culturally you didn't complain in the culture that he was from you did not complain so understanding that about people um, what aggravates it what alleviates it so what makes it better? What makes it worse? Well, it's worse when I do this. Well, don't do that, right? Um, you, don't, you, you may have to explain to people, if it makes it worse, don't do it. But what are some things that would make it worse, right? Um, and then associated manifestations, other things. So if a person's having a heart attack, we know that they will have uh, pain in their arm, right? Shooting pain in their arm. They'll also feel weak, right? Um, they may be confused, those types of things. So there's um, a kind of a constellation is the fancy word for it, but it means there's, a, a, there's a associated manifestations of what's going on. If a person's having stroke, right, we see uh, droop, paralysis, you know what I mean, confusion. So there's this constellation of things. Okay, so some sample questions that I would hope that you would ask, because you are gonna be tested on how well you can take history on Friday. How did it start? What happened? When did it first bother you? Um, was it sudden or did it become wor gradually become worse? You'll notice there's no fancy medical words anywhere in this. So I don't ask the patient, can you tell me if this is an acute or chronic condition, right? As what's the signs and symptoms that you've experienced so far? No, if they're a physician, sure, ask them that. But most people are not physicians. <laughs> For duration and chronology, have you ever experienced this before? Has this been ongoing? Does it kind of come in and go out? Um, how long has it been bothering you? Location, where does it hurt? Right? Can you put your finger in the place where it hurts the most? Does it hurt anywhere else? Right? Um, 
was it Donde Estas Tu Duele? Do you know where is your pain at? Um, what does it feel like? Is it a sharp pain, a stabbing pain, a dull ache, a throbbing pain? How severe is it? Um, and this is, might be that instance where you can ask them on a, on a scale of zero to 10, how severe is it? Um, but I, I, a lot of times I won't say on my, and when I'm, what I'm writing down to the physician, I keep things pretty short and sweet, so I'll just say severe pain, upper left side, right? Um, intermittent pain, um, mild pain. What makes it worse? When is it worse? Is it worse after you eat, right? Um, after you walk, at night, there's some conditions that just kind of occur at night. Um, what has helped you as you've been experiencing this? What helped in the past? Does it still help? Um, some, some conditions change over time. So like a tooth abscess, for example, it might help to do something, but then as it progresses, it, that doesn't help anymore, right? Okay, is there anything else going on? Anything that seems to be related going on? Um, and you'll notice, uh, this is probably not a good example of a question, right? Because <laughs> it has the medical terminology in it, right? Um, uh, so try to find ways to talk about it, even associated manifestations. That's not something I would ever say to a patient. They would think I was talking about something from Ghostbusters, probably, right? Um, all right. So you have some tools at your disposal to understand better what the current physical status is. And the first one, we've already kind of talked about this in a previous lecture, is checking the freaking chart, right? Um, before you even walk into the patient's room, do what the doctors do to look like professionals and check their chart because the chart says a lot about them, right? And I'll tell you this, patients start to get ticked off if you're asking them a question that 15 other people has already asked them. Why are you here today? Well, I just told the last 15 people I talked to, but for your case, I'll tell you again because I like you um, because you're an x-ray tech. No, I hate you now, right? Like there'll be this whole awkward conversation. So. I understand from looking at your chart that you're here for shortness of breath. Is there anything else going on? Much more intelligent question, right? Uh, so checking the chart, I can't stress it enough. Um, if there's questions about the chart, probably the best person to ask is the nurse. Physical assessment. Um, so this is when we walked in the room, we start to look at the patient, try to get a gauge of where they're at, and then we start measuring vital signs, right? So you'll notice we're gonna physically assess the patient. Where are they at cognitively? How are they situated in their bed? Are they completely gorked out, which is the fancy medical term for just passed out in a coma, right? Um, are they, do I smell strong alcohol when I walk into the room, right? Those kinds, types of things. Does the room smell like vomit? Does the room smell like gangrene? Those types of things. Believe me, once you've smelled gangrene, you will never be able to unsmell it. It's a pretty strong smell. Um, and then vital signs, starting to get those vital Look out for these things, because they're important. They'll, they'll either be both on the patient and on the door, right? So the door is your friend, right? Um, somewhere, if the patient has a DNR, allergy risks, fall risks, they should have this. They should, if there's a, a possibility, say the guy's name is literally John Doe, and there's like five other John Does being treated, there will be a name alert. So you're getting the right John Doe happens a lot. Um, so making sure I've got the right person, all of those things are there on the name band. Now, um, it is not helpful, for example, if the patient has a contact isolation, which means you should not be touching them because they have methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, or MARSA, right? Which is not quite a flesh eating virus, but it's bad. You don't want it. Um, uh, if, if the patient has MRSA and you should not be touching them, guess what? It does not help to grab their arm and look at their armband, right? That helped no one, like your, yourself especially. So being aware before I walk into the room, what's going on with this patient before I start grabbing them or anything? Because I've seen students do just that. In a simulation, walk into a room which was contact isolation grab the patient's armband and say, can you tell me your name and date of birth, right? And then proceed to contaminate the entire room, right? All right, 
Physical assessment includes these things, um, skin color and temperature. So the book, one of the fancy terms the book throws us as is cyanotic, which means bluish coloration, right? A lot of times around the lips, if, there's, if they're cold or they're not receiving enough oxygen, you see it a lot with babies. Um, one, of, one of my little kiddos, it's like if he's the least bit cold, he's, his lips turn blue, right? Kind of freaks me out. Um, but uh, another thing to look for is does the patient look completely yellow? Like Bert from Sesame Street. Does this person look like Bert from Sesame Street? Probably there's some kind of jaundice going on, right? Um, and does the patient have a peculiar odor? Do they smell like pickles, right? Something's going on with their stomach if they smell like dill pickles, right? Do they smell like the rotten flesh of a thousand zombies? That's what gangrene smells like, and you will know it immediately. Um, what is the odor in the room, right? Um, is there just a level of uncleanliness, right? Because guess what? Personal hygiene is related to health, right? Um, level of consciousness. How awake and aware are they right now? Are they completely asleep? Are they just asleep and not in a coma, right? These are important questions we have to ask ourselves. And then their breathing rate. That's probably the most subtle one. To watch someone and to watch, like to tell them, I'm not like, well, I'm just checking your breathing rate. You may have to explain that to people. How quickly are they breathing, right? Um, all right, for temperature. On page 195, we have a list of temperatures. And um, we will not be taking rectal temperatures on each other. So um, if you write just above uh, rectal, that is also the, the numbers for tympanic. Um, and I don't really know why they made this chart because it is 99.6 the whole way down. It is a really useless chart. Um, but just right above that tympanic, just know that tympanic temperature, that means temperature in your ear, is about one higher than oral temperature or temperature in your mouth. So it'd be 198 something in the mouth, 199 something in the ear. Memorize those numbers. Um, this is an example here of an oral um, thermometer, right? And the way this one works, you've probably seen uh, folks do this, but it's got like these little uh, probe covers here. You stab this thing down into the probe cover, it is covered, right? Um, and then you can hit this little blue button on top and it knocks the probe cover off, right, into a trash can. You would not knock it off into your hand. I'm just grabbing it for demonstration purposes. Um, so I'll let everyone get a chance to practice with that, just knocking it off, um, covering it up. Um, I'm going to ask that we don't actually do temperatures on this because I don't have quite enough probe covers. And also, I'm more interested in the tympanic measurement right now. And I'll talk about why that's the case. But I'll pass this around just so you have a, a sense of how that thing works. But like I said, you've probably seen people use it. It has, op it has options to use um, uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit. For the most part, we report temperatures in Fahrenheit. And you'll notice all the temperature reported here are in Fahrenheit. I, I would ask you to memorize the Fahrenheit. It, uh, for the registry purposes, it'll have both Fahrenheit and in parentheses next to it, it'll say the Celsius measurement. So anytime there's a unit, possible units that could be used, like different units, it'll have the conversion already there right next to it. So I'm not going to ask you to learn how to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius is what I'm saying, which is nice. I don't like doing those versions. This is the kind that we'll use. Um, it's uh, kind of becoming... Uh, one of the more preferred ones, um, uh, and uh, we call it tympanic because it just goes inside the uh, external ear canal, the EAM, which is your ear hole, right? So it goes inside the ear hole um, with a probe cover. When you're done measuring it, you just pop the probe cover off. So you'll get an opportunity to do that today. And the normal range that I would read there would be what? 99.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Good. Good, good, good. So here's a really happy kid. I don't know what she's doing now. She's got some kind of probe. Oh, uh, temporal, yeah. yeah. Artery thermometer. And she missed fancy pants <laughs> with the infrared sensor or whatever. Um, I've never done that before. Neither one of them seem to be having a good time, so she's moving on. All right, pulse. Um, super important um, to know where to get a pulse on like, like 
who is that? Childish Gambino or something? Um, <laughs> so, like, carotid artery. You can go ahead and do this on yourself. Find your carotid artery. You won't be able to talk into it. It will require some pressure, all right? So apply some pressure. Can we feel it? Good. Um, that's the one that I go for first in an emergency situation. So pay attention, y'all, because guess what? Everything we're talking about today, you're going to use in life or death situations. <laughs> I've had to do CPR how many times? A lot in the hospital. I don't know how many times I've had to do chest compressions in the hospital. I can't count anymore. I've had to do it twice in real life in real life. Like one time I was driving home from the hospital, it was I think Mother's Day or Valentine's Day, I don't remember which, I saw a woman collapse in a parking lot while I was driving past the parking lot, ran over and had to call 911 and start chest compressions. There was another time, it was the day before Christmas Eve, I was putting the, together a Christmas toy and a woman ran out of a house down the block um, screaming and there was a dead person inside. I had to go do chest compressions on a dead person. So you will need to know this. So knowing that the carotid pulse is one of the best ones to go for in emergency situations, very helpful. Because this can be very faint. This, what do we call this one down here? Radio. The radial pulse can be very faint, right? Um, the brachial pulse, I have a really hard time finding it sometimes. But this one, I can always find. And even if my hands are shaking, I can feel it, right? So. Uh, the carotid pulse. Um, apical, you will need a stethoscope to hear, right? Um, but it's on the patient's, it's just below the left breast, if you will, where the apex of the heart is situated, right? So if I'm feeling down the rib cage, it's just to the left of this area here um, called the xiphoid notch, right? Just to the left of that, I'll hear an apical pulse with a stethoscope. I can't press down here and feel it. Right, you can hear it. Um, and then the other one, we'll look at two more today. We'll look at a radial pulse, right down here at the wrist. It's normally on the more lateral side of the wrist. Um, and then we'll look at for the brachial. We'll need to know brachial for blood pressure, right? And again, you really have to press down for the brachial. Um, it's measured in beats per minute. A pulse is measured in beats per minute. So normal is somewhere in around 60 or 70 beats per minute, right? Uh, once we get um, over 100 beats per minute, we have what we call tachycardia. It means their heart is beating too fast. That's on page um, 199. And one thing that I've underlined here above, uh, well, two things. Just on the next page from Childish Gambino is Pulse, you cannot take an accurate pulse using your thumb because your thumb has a pulse in it. You have to use your index and middle finger. Um, uh, and then compress the artery. If you can't feel it, press harder, right? So again, asking, may I take your pulse? I need to press kind of hard to feel for it, right? Um, but then, so I've got, here on page 199, average normal pulse rates in adults vary from 60 to 100 beats per minute. So if they've walked to the department, it might be slightly elevated, right? Um, bradycardia is less than 60 beats per minute. It doesn't have that here. It has it on a later page for some reason, okay? Respirations, I've said this is the difficult one. But you have to watch the person and how frequently are they breathing. How often does their chest rise and fall? Um, so again, asking permission, I'm going to watch your breathing now, right? Translation, I'm not staring at your chest, right? I need to watch your breathing now and to see how quickly you're breathing. So let's not talk for a little bit. I'm just going to watch how you're breathing. Generally, I watch it for 30 seconds. And again, with the pulse, I will measure it for 30 seconds. So I'll either have a, a wristwatch with a second hand on it, or you can use your handy dandy cell phone. 
set a timer for 30 seconds, count the pulse beats for 30 seconds, and then multiply that by two. Then you have beats per minute, right? So if their if their pulse beats in 30 seconds was 40, what is their beats per minute? 80. 80. That makes sense. Ditto with respirations. I'll set my timer for 30 seconds. Watch how much they breathe in, right? And then I'll multiply that times two. The normal respiration for an adult is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Believe me, you will know if someone's got a breathing rate that is too fast. They will look very, very anxious, right? And they'll look <coughs> concerned about having a breathing rate that's too fast. Um, that would be tachypnea. Um, bradypnea is breaths fewer than 12, and that's a person's dying, right? And it's associated with other things as well. Like you might start to hear what they call a death rattle where there's, the breath is rattling in them, right? Um, so there's other signs associated with that. Dyspnea is when a person's just having difficulty breathing is one of the most common things that you will see on orders for chest x-rays. Um, so that's all on page 199 as well. Okay, blood pressure. And you'll notice I've saved this one for last. I've saved it for last on um, the assessments as well. And the reason for that is because if we want an accurate blood pressure, the person needs to be sitting still for about five minutes, right? Not moving around. So in preparation for it, I'll instruct the patient to keep their arm elevated about the level of the heart, right? And to relax, to uncross their legs, right? Because when we cross our legs, it artificially elevates our blood pressure slightly, right? Um, and I'll also inform the person, I need you to stop talking now. I'm going to take your blood pressure. Because, uh, I don't know. Some people talk too much anyways. No, it's uh, blood, people's blood pressure can increase if they're talking too much. Um, so silence is helpful, especially if you're, doing a, if you're doing a manual blood pressure, you're listening for something. I can't listen to what you're saying right now. I'm listening for your heart rate and what's happening with the blood pressure. Um, this is probably one of the most commonly m mispronounced terms in medicine, sphygmomonitor. Um, uh, is how I say it, and uh, <laughs> if you want to say it a different way, that's fine. It means basically hand pump, right? Um, so I don't know why we don't just call, start calling it a hand pump, because um, that's what it is. It's a hand-powered pump, right, that allows you to gauge pressure, right? Um, but uh, that pressure is going to be expressed as a systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. So systolic is the top number, diastolic is the bottom number. Um, in, uh, in one way that I think about it is, I think about systolic being like the heart pressure and diastolic being the vessel pressure, right? Um, that's the way that I, I tend to think about it. For a systolic, the heart pressure is going to be higher because it's doing the pumping work, right? So it's got uh, 95 to 119, they're now saying is normal. In the past, normal went up to like 120, it was higher. Now they're calling that prehypertensive. So um, that's one of the reasons you remember earlier in the, in the year, um, I said get the most recent version of this textbook because you need to know the current blood pressure stuff and it has changed even in the last what two years I think um, so uh, 119 now is now the top of normal uh, diastolic is 60 to 79 that would be uh, so generally the way that it's written is with uh, so if I was writing that on here I would say 119 over in this case 79 would be the top of normal, right? Um, I don't really like how, it seems like to me, the textbook could have done a better job of writing this out, right? Um, and you'll notice this is a, a unitless expression, I believe, um, when it's written this way, but it is milligrams of HG. Does anyone know what that means? Yes, yeah, this is going way back in the history book. 
to when we associated this with mercury um, related to the devices that we we're measuring with, um, but it's still there. Um, so milligrams of mercury, but generally you just see it written like that. And I don't want you to get thrown off by it if you see it this other way. Um, so uh, this is where I think the book would have done a better job of having a table all of this stuff right here. Um, so it's helpful to know hypertensive, I think we all know that means a high blood pressure. Hi hypotensive means a low blood pressure. And where you will see it most commonly is a person goes into shock. If they go into shock, the first sign is blood pressure bottoms out. Blood pressure bottoms out. Hypertensive is normally like emergency heart situation. Um, but the, all of this information here, I've starred it just below where it's showing the blood pressure cuff going on. Um, I would create a chart or a flashcard that just has this written out. Like what is the range of normal? What is um, hypertensive? What is hypotensive? Um, because they didn't, I wish I kind of wanted to make a, a table myself, but I just thought, you know what, I'll just, I'll pass that on to y'all, pass the savings on to y'all. Um, if you're curious about how to measure a blood pressure, right, I'll also send you out a video showing a nurse doing it. Um, uh, there are some inaccuracies in the video, right? But she does not mention walking, washing your hand prior to doing it, right? Um, she also says that 120 is normal. That's not true anymore, right? It was maybe true when the video was made. But she does give some really good tips on how to measure, make sure the cuff is the right size, where to place the cuff, um, those types of things. Some more practical type stuff. I, I like the video for that. I'll send that out in an email. All right, so here's those um, hypertensive stages, right? And the hypotensive stages. Just written out um, in a little bit more detail. And uh, what I, one of the things I've alluded to already is that um, we now have what we're calling pre-hypertensive. Pre-hypertensive, it's not on here, but um, the book details that. <coughs> okay, lab tests. Now, I, I know that we're not becoming lab technologists, right? Um, but there are some lab tests that we need to know. So looking at page two, 202, I say you need to know a normal white blood cell count, platelet count, partial thromboplastin time, or PTT, serum creatinine, and BUN. We need to know these numbers for different reasons. White blood cell count is going to tell you if the patient has an infectious process going on, because when there's an infectious process going on, white blood cell count increases. Um, the platelet count and the PTT, we need to know that for blood clotting assessment. So if we're doing any kind of interventional procedure or something where we have to insert something into the patient's body, we need to know what the clotting factors are. Because it's very possible if they have decreased clotting factors, if they're on a, a blood thinner, we could try to do something as simple as starting an IV and the patient bleeds out all over the place. Right? So again, figuring out, are you on, on, any, are you on any blood thinners? Um, these other two, serum creatinine and BUN, we need to know to assess their kidney function and their liver function. That's important to us as x-ray techs because those things determine if we are safe to give the patient IV contrast, right? So if the patient has impaired kidney function, that could affect things related to contrast um, excretion, getting rid of the contrast. So all that kind of is detailed here. Um, so blood clotting assessments, we've got a discussion of what a thrombus and embolus are, and then it starts talking about PT and PTT, right? Um, it also 
uh, indicates that these can be, if they're elevated, those, those are going to increase the patient's risk for um, stroke, right? Um, if, there's, if there's a higher number there. Um, and then D-dimer is sometimes used as well. A lot of times for pulmonary embolism studies, we'll just see elevated D-dimer. And that means that kind of throughout uh, the vascular system, there's coagulation. There's coagulation throughout. I don't really care very much about glucose or cholesterol because they don't affect my job, right? I'm sorry if you got high, if you got high uh, cholesterol or if you have diabetes, that is important. You need to monitor that, um, but it is very, very seldom has it been impactful to my job. The one that has probably impacted the most of those two would be if a person is type one diabetic and they have not had anything to eat. That is a problem waiting to happen. So be aware that if the person has fasted overnight as quickly as possible, as soon as the exam is done, get them some orange juice or a candy bar or something, right? Um, they will communicate with you about that. But that could be a, a serious situation if you don't help them. Um, one thing I'll add about the discussion of BUN and, and uh, creatinine um, is that we are now using a calculation called the GFR or EGFR. We'll talk about it again, um, but it's using the creatinine, patient's age, um, and, a, and a few other things about the patient's uh, um, race or gender that can help us better understand how their kidney function works. Because guess what? Kidney function changes based on a person's gender. It changes if they're, if they're Caucasian or African American. It changes. Um, for a number of different reasons. So we started to calculate um, uh, creatinine based on that. All right, I'm not gonna talk about electronic patient monitoring, but you're gonna see a lot of people on it. So I don't want you to be surprised by that. That's why I brought this uh, stupid, uh, yeah, what is this thing, clothespin? I grabbed it, I stole it from my wife the other day. You're gonna see people that have a pulse oximeter on their finger. It is a plastic, clothespin that is on their finger, it has a laser inside of it, and it is measuring the amount of oxygen in their blood system, right? You've probably seen someone ha that has this on their finger in the hospital. Um, if it falls off, their oxygen level will appear to fall to zero, right? But they will continue talking to you, which you know, exercising your critical thinking <clears throat> skills and your understanding of patient diversity, that would never happen, right? Um, so replace it on their finger, and their pulse uh, oxygen will go back up, right? Um, so this is a pulse oximeter. It also can, it can be stuck on an earlobe, especially with babies. It'll be taped to the earlobe. I'm not sticking this on my earlobe. That'd be too painful. Um, but it can be taped to a baby's earlobe, and it's measuring again the amount of oxygen in their bloodstream, right? Super helpful thing to know. Normal oxygen amounts are 95 to 100. You may want to write that down somewhere. 95 to 100 is a normal oxygen amount. So you're going to see a lot of people with these things on. I don't know that they're ever clean, which is disgusting when you think about it. Um, so I would advise you to clean them when at all possible. Um, we may also have arterial catheters. Um, and this is a way to measure cardiac um, activity and blood pressure and stuff like that on, on a pretty con continuous uh, measure. Um, but uh, that's, a, that's a more rare thing. And so one thing I'll kind of add in thinking about arterial catheters and, and more rare type things, we do need to know about this stuff before we're taking up blood pressure, right? So one thing, kind of maybe going back a few slides, is when I take a blood pressure, which arm can I take a blood pressure on? Because people will have a preference, right? Which arm do you want me to take a blood pressure on? You might think, well, I don't care. Some people do. If a person's had a mastectomy, they have been told by a physician, do not allow people to take a blood pressure on the side that you've had the mastectomy, right? Because increasing pressure on that arm could increase risks for what they call lymphedema, swelling in the arm, right? If the patient has active lymphedema, don't take a blood pressure in that arm. Right? If the patient has an IV in that arm, don't take a blood pressure in that arm. If they have a PICC line, right, um, don't take a blood pressure in that arm. 
right? Uh, if they have a history of blood clots in that arm, don't take a blood pressure in that arm. So asking them some questions about this type of stuff is going to be helpful. If they're like, I don't know what you're talking about, fine. You know, which arm do you want me to take a blood pressure on? Okay, two kind of weird things. The, the ECG or EKG and the electroencephalography. We've actually created now a separate modality that just looks at this stuff. We now have, we're starting to offer classes in it here at the college because it has evolved so much. So notice that I'm in a single slide going to be talking about something that I said we've created a separate modality for and it has emerged in the last two years. It's been pretty remarkable to watch that change. Um, but that doesn't mean you need to be freaked out by if you're asked to do an ECG or an EKG. A lot of patients will already have something like an electrocardiograph monitor that they're wired up to if they're in the emergency room, right? So it's helpful to know what is the protocol for the monitor at the facility you're at, because it will change, right? Some facilities, the patient can come to x-ray off the monitor. Other facilities, no, you need to take the monitor with you. You can just detach it. You can get a little in-service on how to, how to take the monitor with you, right? Have the nurse sign off. This student's okay to take the monitor with you. I've mentioned that text will push you in front of the bus. This is a place of bus pushing, right? Go get the patient from the ER. And they don't tell you what the protocol is there. Well, then go ask the nurse. Do you want me to take the patient on the monitor or can I take them off the monitor? Right? Look and see what's happening. Look around you and see what's happening. As a general rule, what, the way that we memorize where the little electrodes go is white on the right, smoke over fire, right? So the white electrode will be on the upper right-hand side of their chest, right, with a little sticky thing. And then there will be a red one down here on the left side, that's the fire, and a black one up here, that's the smoke. So white on the right, smoke over fire. That's in the textbook. Um, I think it's worth memorizing. Uh, and uh, if there's ever, a, if you see the thing flatlined, but again, the patient is talking to you, one of those little electrodes has fallen off. You do not need to initiate a code. I like these little illustrations here, because they. Uh, uh, this is all I need to know about them, is this is a normal sinus rhythm, nice and uniform, right? You got the spike and the two bumps, and then another spike, right? If it's tachycardia, I got the spike and the two bumps, but they're a lot closer together, so the heart's beating faster, right? Spike and two bumps, spike and two bumps, spike and two bumps. That's tachycardia, right? Um, bradycardia, it's, it's beating slower. And now we see here's our definition for bradycardia. But it's spike, bump, bump. Spike, bump, bump. It's slower, right? And a lot of times it'll have a readout. It'll tell you what their heart rate is on the machine. It'll tell you. These other ones are kind of good. So ventricular fibrillation. You can just look at that and say, that ain't good. <laughs> there ain't a spike and there's just a whole bunch of bumping going on. Like, that's a bad thing. So that means that the ventricles ain't working, right? The ventricles are not working. Um, here we have ventricular tachycardia. That's scary not good, right? Um, and then this one's the more subtle one. If you look at atrial fibrillation, which I've said a lot of people have, chances are someone in this room has it right now, right? Um, a lot of people, it's just part of how they live their lives. They got spike, bump, meh. Spike, bump, 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 then spike, bump, meh. Like it's, it's doing, it's not doing the spike, bump, bump. Spike, bump, bump. That's what I should hear, the loved up, right? Um, they're getting, and so I put who dad. I don't know why I wrote that, but that's what I'd be thinking if I saw that. Um, all right, the final thing is an electroencephalography. Um, all I can say about this is this is electronic monitoring of brain activity. It has progressed a lot. Um, we can now do some pretty amazing stuff with this exam, but all you need to know about it is that it's measuring electrical activity in the brain. And it's sometimes used to diagnose things like a seizure disorder, um, sleep apnea, things like that. Okay.